Uh, let's pray. Father God, we come before you. I just heard that uh, Carol, uh, Sister Carol, Barry's wife, is uh, just ready to go to church and couldn't make it. She feels like she may have a hernia or something. Lord, we pray that you would be with her, Father, and bring healing to her body and comfort her and give them wisdom, Lord, and be the strength of their lives. Father, we pray for our sister Gina and Tom and the whole family. We just pray that you would minister your healing grace and your love and mercy to them and that you would just bring them close to your heart, Father, in your arms and their family. And we pray for those who are sick amongst us, who are with the flus or other sicknesses or diseases. We pray for healing, Father, and that you stretch out your hand, Father, and that you do a mighty work in our lives. And, and Father, for the times that you don't bring healing, we pray for your abiding grace as Paul had a thorn in the flesh, Lord, and he said, he asked you to take it away three times, Lord, and you said that your grace was sufficient for him. We pray that your grace would be more than sufficient for all of us. And we pray that as we open up your word, Father, that you would open up our hearts and that you would have your way with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Praise God. Good to see everybody. Uh, we will be getting back to Ecclesiastes pretty soon. I wanted to do one more message on the church called Church 101, Restoring or Preserving Pristine Christianity, what the early church taught. Uh, the church has by and large throughout the world departed so radically from the teachings of Jesus, uh, the apostles, the prophets. And we're looking at, that was a two-part series. I have one more on that. And I also wanted to do one more message uh, before we got to Ecclesiastes. I want to do one on Revelation because I said every once in a while on a Sunday, we'll bring the Revelation series here and then we'll go back uh, at another time you know, to whatever book we're going through or whatever topical message we're on. And I just thought, you know what, this would be the perfect Sunday uh, to do it. Uh, I was going to do Church 101, but I decided to switch gears and do one Revelation study. Uh, and actually, will be kind of all over the Bible because of the timing. We just released our new debate, which isn't new anymore, but it's new. Uh, we had to wait, I think, over a year to get it uh, from Prophecy in the News after the debate. Uh, we were told a few months, it just for whatever reasons, they didn't release it for over a year. Uh, we got it. Then it took us some time to put it in the format to where you could actually get it on the uh, YouTube and the internet and amongst a lot of things that the guys were juggling. But we got it up last Tuesday, I believe. So I'll let you know that that's up there. And that was my debate with Dr. Doug Stoffer at uh, Prophecy of the News Bible Conference in Twin Peaks in Colorado. They flew us out there and accommodated us, and we had a great time. We had a pretty good entourage that showed up, and it was on their turf. It was a pre-trib prophecy conference, and I was the, I thought I was the lone post-tribber, but I had even some teachers that came up to me quietly and said, hey, because they didn't want people to know that they're post-trib, that I'm post-trib, I hope you win the debate, you know, kind of thing. And it went really well. Uh, and I was already open to whatever the Lord had this morning. I was working on a couple different things, including having been working on uh, part two of Church 101. And then I was at talk with some, at some length last night with Austin. Uh, he said he'll be here, so I'm waiting for him to show up, but uh, I'd like him to hear this message too. We talked for about an hour, and he said that someone dear to him uh, was, you know, taught pre-trib and so forth, and he was preparing. And when I say pre-trib, if you're visiting, you're new to uh, the Christian faith, or you're examining it, uh, the trib refers to the tribulation period, the last, the great tribulation is the last three and a half years of history before Jesus Christ returns. Uh, sometimes we speak of Daniel's 70th week. That speaks of the last seven years. In the middle of that seven-year period, there will be an Antichrist who will break a covenant that he's made with the many nations and turn on Israel, and there will be, you know, hell will break loose on earth for three and a half years. And many want to believe that the church is going to be evacuated, taken off the planet before that tribulation period begins. Pre-trib usually says seven years before the second coming. There's another coming, which really makes it a second and a third coming, which the Bible doesn't teach, uh, where the church is taken. And then the church, many of them teach we have a big party in heaven while everybody else is being, the Jews and those who become Christians here are being slaughtered. We're partying it up with Jesus, which doesn't make any sense. When you go to Revelation chapter 6, you see those who in heaven during that time are crying out to God, not having a party. How long until you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? It's not the scenario the Bible presents that's being presented by pre-trib. We are uh, classical post-tribulationists. That was the view of the early church. Most pre-trib scholars and leaders admit that the early church uh, knew nothing of a pre-tribulation rapture. They were, they knew of a, uh, they were premillennial. They believed Christ would come before the thousand years, but it was at the second coming after the tribulation uh, they were post-tribulational. 
That's, the early church believed that. Uh, there was no debate in the church for 1,800 years on pre or post because it wasn't a teaching that was part of any church creed out of the thousands of churches that existed. And we uh, believe we need to talk about these kinds of issues. They're very important. Uh, in fact, the brother, uh, when I mentioned Austin, he had mentioned that he went to the internet. He had some scriptures that I had shared in the message in the past. He's been living, you know, uh, in the northern part of the state. He's out here for a while, living out here now uh, with, with his wife, Kaylee, uh, great people. And he was trying to assemble some scriptures, and he had some from a past message, but he said he just typed in debate, pre versus post, and he said our debate came up. Boom, it came up. Now keep in mind, he did all this on Tuesday afternoon. Our debate was put up Tuesday morning. So the odds that that were happening, he goes, it was just uncanny. He goes, wow, I heard you had a debate. I'm saying this to you because uh, the debate's up there. And a lot of you, if I said you'd seen it, you'd raise your hand, but you only saw part of it because the day that uh, it was shown in this fellowship, Pastor Steve taught during the service, and you missed the first hour, which was great. I wanted them to preach that day. And then those that stayed behind, not that you were left behind, those that stayed behind, you watched the, the rest of the debate. You saw probably six hours of it or whatever, seven-hour debate or so. Uh, you missed the first hour. That first hour packs a punch. So I want to encourage you, if you already saw the debate, go to our YouTube channel, go to Good Fight Ministries YouTube channel, and watch the first session. Uh, Austin said, after you opened, because I was able to open, he said it was so clear and so powerful that you had already won the debate. It was just like, he, he said, I expected your opponent to come up and concede at that point. He really, and he was serious. He goes, but he didn't, <laughs> you know? And he goes, I expected him to uh, say, acknowledge something. Well, I want you to encourage you to watch that part if you haven't seen the whole thing. And we haven't done a blast yet where we make it available to all the people that, you know, we're in contact with tens of thousands of people. Uh, I think almost 70,000 on YouTube subscribers and another 40 plus thousand on, uh, on our uh, Facebook. So over 100,000 people uh, because we're just waiting to gear up for it, but we're already getting responses. And my wife put this on my desk this morning, my office desk in my house. Uh, it was from someone named Richard. Very nice letter. And I, I'm saying if these people aren't part of the fellowship and a lot of people are watching it and getting blessed, you can get blessed by your own fellowship's debates, you know. Uh, I just uh, want to thank you for your ministry, what the Lord has given to you to do. I've purchased some of your CDs and DVDs. Love Your Left Behind or Let Us Stray DVD. That's our video expose on the, the, the most in-depth, powerful view of the history of the, of the pre-trib rapture because it's not found in deep history in the... In the, in the uh, church fathers and so forth. And we show how it arrived, how it brought, sadly brought division to the church and what have you. Uh, I love your left behind, left straight DVD. I just watched all seven hours of your debate. So that's separate, the day we just put, with Doug Stoffer. Wow, I think uh, it's a debate you clearly won. I praise the Lord uh, how you remained faithful to the scriptures and spoke in the spirit of the love of Christ. I was truly blessed by watching it. Blessings to you and your ministry, God bless. So I want you to get blessed. He was blessed. And you need to be up on these situations because the scriptures tell us that there'll be a great falling away in the end times. Jesus says when the tribulation starts, many will be handed over to be killed. And then he says right after that, verses 8 and 9, in verse 8 he talks about many, they will deliver you up, betray you, and what have you, and, and many will be killed and what have you. And he says, the very next verse, and many will fall away. Why do many fall away at that point? Because they're not ready. They're not ready for persecution because they're being taught that they're going to be raptured off the earth before it occurs, before the persecution occurs. In fact, Tim LaHaye, I have a chart. He's the one who wrote the Left Behind series. I have a chart in one of his books where he puts, he has verses 8 and 9 of Matthew 24, and he says that the rapture happens between verses 8 and 9, between the, uh, you know, right before everybody's, you know, brought up to be killed and the falling away takes place is the rapture. And that's what blows me away is that's what's actually encouraging the falling away because Jesus said, I told you these things ahead of time so when they come to pass, you will not fall away. To be forewarned, he says, uh, behold, I have warned you in advance. It's another thing he said regarding the tribulation period. So we're supposed to be warned, to be forewarned is be forearmed, amen? If you know that something, a big crisis is coming up that you gotta be ready for, you're gonna be prepared, Amen? If you don't know and you think you're not going to go through it and you get caught off guard, your reactions can be very sad, actually. Amen? And I've given examples in history where people were waiting for a pre-trib rapture and they got 
persecuted instead, some of them tearing up their Bibles type of thing, denying their faith because they thought they were going to get out of here and escape from persecution. The story of the church has been persecution for 2,000 years, amen? Almost every one of the apostles was killed, okay? Persecuted to the point of death. Uh, John, the, John the apostle was exiled in the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 1-9. The one apostle that we read about that wasn't actually killed was exiled for his faith. And we think for some reason, because we live in the West and we have, you know, that we have some kind of privilege that Christians today will escape these things. And it just blows me away. So I wanted to address some of the questions that came up. And I've been coming up. Uh, one of the things, uh, t uh, the, the star in the Left Behind movies, the first movie that came out was Kirk Cameron. He was, you know, the main guy. And uh, some of you know, and we're in the fellowship even at that time, going back some years, uh, the very weekend it came out, he came to our fellowship and he said he'd heard some of my messages on the timing of the rapture. And he said, hey, I was John MacArthur. He went to John MacArthur Seminary for some time. He said, I sat under 10 years. I was convinced the rapture was pre-trib, but I never really looked at the other side. And then I looked at the scriptures that you presented, and it became clear to me through studying those scriptures that the rapture is at the end of the tribulation. And he goes, and I'm the left behind guy. He just made the movie, you know. And he was shocked. Well, sometime later, I was asked to speak somewhere at the same event he was speaking at, and we were both speaking at different times at the same event, and the, per the, the person that was kind of cheering that, that get-together uh, had us meet at the same restaurant together, and he said, hey, we hadn't seen each other some time. I'd gone over his house and what have you, and we talked about the scriptures and so forth, and prior to that, and, and uh, he said, I'm still post-trib. He goes, but I have a friend of mine who's been hitting me with the scripture of that day and that hour knows no man, you know? not the angels and what have you. And he goes, you know, and he keeps saying, no one knows the day and the hour, so how could it be post-trib if no one knows the day and the hour? And I began to answer that, not knowing, you know, as I began talking, the other person that was there was, I'm pre-trib, you know? And so he just went through some scriptures, and at the end, of the, when I went through a couple scriptures, oh, it only took a few minutes of our meeting, he was like, oh, that's clear. And he's, you know, still doesn't believe a pre-trib rapture. But Somebody asked me, they go, why, the scriptures seem so clear on this issue. Why do people maintain and keep holding the preacher view? And I said, you know, one of the suggestions that came up, we're talking with a few people, was money. There's a lot of money in it. There are by some of the people that are promoting it. But I said, I don't want to always say that's the motive. I, I believe a lot of times it's because we like the path of least resistance, you know. That's our human nature, amen? I mean, if you have door A or door B, and door B is going through tribulation, and you see people are divided on it, you're going to want, I hope point A is, Correct. And we've had people already, and the debate's only been up for a little while, and like I said, we really haven't adverted it through to our constituency and beyond yet, and we're already getting responses. I've got a couple pre-tribs that say, hey, I'm pre-trib. Different ones saying, but the arguments that you make are strong, and I have to look at them. Another gal said she used to belong to a cult. Now she goes to uh, a Calvary Chapel, and she goes, but the one thing that wasn't settling was they weren't showing me enough, you know, wasn't making it clear the pre-trib rapture didn't settle with me. She goes, I'm so thankful I watched this debate. It's very clear that it's post-trib now, you know? So we're getting a lot of responses uh, like that, and if you want to go look at the questions or, or the responses on our, on our YouTube site, uh, there's a, a lot of good responses, but we want to look at these questions. I want to look at the questions as to, you know, what the scriptures say in this regard. So uh, you also have the concept that's floated around like, hey, he's coming like a thief in the night. Since he's coming like a thief in the night, that must mean, and no one knows the day and the hour, that must mean it can, can, it can be any second. It can be imminent. And one of the watchwords is imminency in the pre-trib camp, uh, that, hey, the, the coming's imminent. By the way, Paul did not believe, and Peter did not believe in an imminent, any moment return of Christ. They taught expectancy, watching for the signs, but not imminency. How do I know that? I have no doubt about it. Peter talks about how, you know, the, you know, we see that Jesus told Peter in John chapter 21 how he was going to be killed and martyred. Amen? So did Peter think that prophecy, Jesus was going to become a false prophet and he was going to be raptured and not and escape death? Yes or no? No, he knew that he was going to die. He didn't believe Jesus was coming at any moment. He wasn't going to write that Jesus is coming at any moment. The Apostle Paul talked about how he would be martyred in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. He was being poured out, ready to be poured out as a drink offering. He had finished his course, kept his faith, you know, fought the good fight, and talked about his coming martyrdom. Obviously, he didn't believe he was going to be raptured any moment. The Bible doesn't teach any moment return. It teaches certain things must have to come to pass before Christ comes back, including both of their deaths, right? Including the preaching of the gospel. Jesus said that when they asked about the coming, his coming, 
he told them that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world as a witness to who? All the nations. Then the end would come, amen? And that's what Paul said, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then the deliverer will come from Zion, Romans chapter 11. And that's why Peter said, hasten or speed up the coming of the Lord. He's talking about going out and witnessing because God's being patient toward you, not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And the Lord's not slack concerning his promise regarding his return, but he's waiting on us to finish the great commission, to get out there and be a witness to the lost. We've been given a job, church. The job isn't to just wait around and say, when is Jesus going to come back and do nothing? He said, occupy until I come. Amen? We're supposed to be occupying and doing the work. And he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all the nations. He gave that great commission to the church, not to the 144,000, not to the Jews. He gave it to the Jews and Gentiles in the church. And that's why he said in Matthew 24 or Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Go into all the world. Verse 18, he says, you know, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. He's given us the power. He's with us. And he said, go into all the world preaching the gospel to who? All nations. Making disciples of all men, right? Right? Teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. Baptizing them, he says, too, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Not seven years before the end of the age, but the end of the age. And like I've said before, can you imagine watching the Super Bowl and it's a really close game and, and you were getting slaughtered, your team, and now you've come back and now there's two minute warning and you're marching and you have a chance to enter into the red zone and score. And the owner says, hey, I just like the job these guys have been doing. They really, you know, they kind of struggled really. You know, I'm gonna have somebody else finish this job for them. Call the, call the starters up, you know. Call the starters up and, and bring them up to the booth above and we'll just all hang out and watch the last two minutes together. Do you think any owner would do that of a football team? Yes or no? No. You think Jesus is gonna take us out when we're most needed as far as a biblical witness and most need to shine the light when the world needs us the most, uh, needs, needs to see the witness of Jesus? No. And that's not what the Bible teaches, that he's taking us out in the last two minutes. But you know what? I told you before, the prophet Hananiah, he came to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was prophesying. Now keep in mind, Jeremiah was prophesying to the people of Judah that they were going to go into captivity. He begins his prophecies by talking to the northern kingdom who was already in exile. The northern kingdom went into exile about 150 years before them at the hand of the Assyrians. Those in Judah were going into exile because God was to discipline them with Babylon. Babylon's king was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is a picture of the Antichrist, remember? Remember the, t remember the statue made of him? 60 cubits wide, six cubits, or 60 cubits high, six cubits wide, six instruments used to worship, music, 666, picture of the Antichrist, an image of him who's a picture of the beast. The Bible says in Revelation 13, there'll be an image made of the Antichrist or the beast, and people will be called to worship that. He was a picture of the Antichrist. The 70 years was a picture of a, a, a tribulation period. But guess what was happening in Jeremiah's day? The false prophets were saying, don't worry, you know, Jeremiah's wrong. You're not gonna have to go through that time. God's just too loving. He wouldn't let you go through that time. And you know what else they were telling them? In chapter 13, they were telling the people that they didn't need to repent of their sin to have life, that they didn't have to turn back. Once you're right with God, you're always right with God. It was, you know, once you're saved, hey, everything's fine, even though they were rebellion. And he told the people in Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Jeremiah, he says that the, the, the people were under the delusion, believed the lie that they had been delivered or saved to these abominations to commit murders and lies and thefts. Sound familiar? Sounds like a lot today. Oh, I've been saved. I could do what thou wilt. No. The Bible says once saved, abide in Christ. Okay? That's my new saying. Once saved, abide in Christ. Because Jesus said in John 15, 6, every branch that's in me that does not, every branch that does not remain, abide, meno, in me, withers, is, you know, dries up and withers and is cut off, thrown in the fire and burned. Those are strong warnings that we dare not patch over with blank pieces of paper. And so the false teachers, the false prophets were saying that you're not going to go through that 70-year tribulation period. You're not going to face that picture of the Antichrist, Nebuchadnezzar. Don't worry. And if you're not repenting of your sin, don't worry. God's favor is still upon you. Those two doctrines were a recipe for destruction for those in Jeremiah's day. 
In fact, when Hannah, Jeremiah literally took a yoke. He had a yoke strapped to him. And he's walking around with his yoke, you know? And uh, I don't, do I got to stay here to be in the camera shot for our live stream audience? Praise the Lord for you guys. He, he was, he had this yoke on him and Hananiah, saying 70 years in Babylon. Hananiah, whose name means grace of God, fake grace, comes and takes that yoke, hyper grace, comes and takes that yoke and often throws it down and says, thus say the Lord. He says, we're not going to go through that time. Well, even as he's saying that, the Babylonians have already invaded, taking the temple implements. And you know what Jeremiah says? Every prophet that prophesies peace will be known by his words if they come to pass to Hananiah. But the prophets before you prophesied of wars and desolations. What did he do? He said, you know what? We're going to see if what your words come to pass. But you know what God's word already reveals? That there's going to be wars and desolations. And he says, he leaves, and then God says, go back to him and tell him this. You've made my people believe a lie. And you've counseled my children in rebellion against me. Wait a minute. How did he make them believe a lie and counsel the children of his, God's children in rebellion? He didn't tell them to go after Malak. He didn't tell them to follow the Baals. He didn't say anything about false gods or not following the Lord other than not, other than this. What God's revealed through Jeremiah, but he says it's not God. That time period's wrong. We're gonna, be take, we're, we're gonna escape that, that 70 year period. That was very serious before the Lord, wasn't it? Do you understand? That was very serious because that lie would help, would, would cause them to be caught, caught off guard. Not get right with God, be caught off guard, and then end up in that period of time. And then when he says, you've counseled my children in rebellion, how does he mean rebellion? Because what happens when people get angry with God when they feel like God hasn't kept his promise? They get angry, and they rebel. And that's why Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, concerning Christ coming and our being gathered together to him, the rapture, don't be deceived by any means, he says. That day when Christ comes to rapture us will not come to pass until he says what two events take place. It's not pre-trib, he says, until the fallen away, the apostasy comes, and the man of sins revealed, the son of perdition, who sits in the temple of God, showed himself that he is God. Now listen to this. That word apostasy, you know how it's translated in most modern translations, like I think the ESV, NIV maybe as well? Rebellion. Rebellion. And that word apostasy is so often used of those who turn from God, rebel against his word, and turn to idols. And in the last days, we have fallen away and people will turn to the Antichrist and his image. And the church is being set up with a mass deception and being taught that don't worry. Even though Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, flee. Even, John, even though John says, you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many are in the world. Even though Paul said the rapture won't take place until the fallen away or a rebellion and Antichrist comes first. Even though the book of Revelation shows the bride goes through the tribulation and isn't ready for her, her, her bridegroom's return until Revelation 19, after the tribulation events have taken place, and that the beast will persecute the saints, Revelation 13, 5. They say, even though it says all this, it really doesn't mean that. What it really means is that we're going to get raptured before all that starts to take place, and we're going to be out of here. We won't have to face that time. Really? This church had offered for several years $10,000 for just one verse. Just one verse showing that the rapture would proceed. And you'd get 10,000 bucks, just one clear verse that says the rapture will take place before the tribulation. No one was able to claim it. I had one guy say, give me a verse that say, hey, this I think might lean that way. And I said, no, because this and this and this. And he goes, yeah, I know, I'm post-trib anyway. I was just trying. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> Lord, have mercy on that guy. You know? But even though the scriptures are very clear on this subject, ha, very clear on this subject, the church is being set up. And I'm not saying that everybody that says, hey, the rapture's come before the tribulation, and you don't, you know, and so forth, is a Hananiah, okay? By the way, Jeremiah prophesied that Hananiah would be put to death, and I think within two years, the next very next chapter says he died, okay? I'm not saying everybody that believes in a pre-trib rapture is a false prophet. I believe that it originated from a different spirit, Look at our video, Left Behind or Let Astray. We show the occult origins of this idea of a secret rapture. 
While Margaret McDonald wasn't the, didn't teach a clear pre-trib rapture, we show that she's the first one we can find that taught a secret rapture, okay? Which is part of the pre-trib rapture teaching, which we show in Left Behind or Led Astray. And that she had influence on many people uh, who were part of a movement that came up with the pre-trib rapture. Uh, Edward Irving and others, and had all these false prophecies, and members of their movement claimed that they were under the utterance, speaking under the power of demons. It's a lie from the pit of hell. I have no, and I have to speak the truth, okay? And I know, I mean, our videos go far and wide. I have a lot of friends in the Christian community. Uh, there's, there's a lot of acceptance on one level, but guess what? I knew I slit my throat as far as being one of the boys when I came against pre-trib and I came against easy believism, and I came against hyper grace, and I came against the prosperity gospel, and I came against the Hebrew roots movement, and all these other things I come against that I have to come against because I hold true to the word of God. And I know that, but I'm not, it's not about being accepted by people. It's about being right with God, preparing people to be right with God so they know him, so they're saved by grace through faith, so that they're ready when Jesus comes back or when they die. Because I'm gonna give account for you guys and those who hear me. I could care less if I'm accepted by everybody, you know? And Jesus says, woe unto you when all men speak well of you because they spoke well of the false prophets, you know? And then he says, you're in good company, basically. I'm paraphrasing him there. Uh, when they persecute you because they persecuted him and the true prophets of God. So we have to speak the truth. And it matters. Truth matters. Why did Jesus give us the longest sermon he gave, Matthew chapter 24 and 25, even longer than the, 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 the Sermon on the Mount when you put Luke 13, or Mark 13, Luke 21 with Matthew 24, 25. It's all out of the discourse. The longest sermon he ever gave. Why did he give the, 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 the apostles of the early church such strong warnings if it had nothing to do with them? Why did he give John the book of Revelation and address it to the churches if it had nothing to do with the churches? By the way, all the promises to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 and the warnings... If you read, continue to read the book of Revelation, they tie into the rest of the book, you know, about keeping their garments, you know, about staying awake, you know, about and all these other promises and warnings in Revelation 2 and 3 of the churches. You go through the book, you see it's tied into those, the blessings that come to those who persevere and overcome through the rest of the book. It's, and it's addressed to the seven churches. And it's not just the seven churches. At the end of each church, pretty much it says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. It's addressed to us. So, what of these scriptures in Matthew 24, or these scriptures that say, but no one knows the day and the hour. Of that day and hour knows no man. And he comes like a thief in the night. That means he can come at any time. Does it really? No, it doesn't. Let's look at the context of those verses. Go please to Matthew 24, because guess what? Ha, they show up in Matthew chapter 24. And by the way, Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24 was always understood to be addressed to the church. And if it's addressed to the church, guess what? It talks about facing the Antichrist and many falling away and having to persevere to the end during the tribulation period. It was always understood as being addressed to the church until a man arose by the name of John Darby. And if somebody else said it doesn't pertain to the church, somebody before John Darby in the, in the 19th century said that, then I will stand corrected, but guess what I'll also say? But it was through John Darby and not that other guy you find that this movement spread and this understanding spread. Because I haven't seen any documented evidence that started with someone else. But if you show me documented evidence that somebody else said Matthew 24 is not to the church, it's to the 144,000 after the church's raptured. If you show me that, I'm still going to be able to say to you, guess what? It was through John Darby, who was influenced by Edward Irving, who was influenced by Margaret McDonald with a secret rapture, that this idea spread that, oh, we don't need to look at this as pertaining to us. I document all this in our video, Left Behind and Led Astray. Now, and I encourage you to grab that and watch that. There's a lot of visuals. I mean, I traveled across the world with some people shooting that and did interviews and everything, uh, even with pre-trib and so forth. Uh, it's a pretty encouraging or eye-opening video. But Jesus says in Matthew 24, when they ask him, Verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age, the end, end of the Ionas? And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one must lead you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And I will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened for those things must take place, but the end is not yet. That was not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. 
But all these things are merely the beginning, they're birth pains. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Now, did you see the rapture between verses 8 and 9? Yes or no? No. That's where Tim LaHaye says it takes place. But you know when he says in verse 9, then they will deliver who? You. Who's he talking to? The apostles. Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Their names are given in Mark 13 where you see the same discourse. The apostles of the early church. Jesus said the apostles are the foundation of the church. He says, when you, which in the Greek is a personal plural pronoun. Okay, you guys. Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Should they live long enough, right? And whoever they represent. When you, uh, they will deliver you to tribulation. You catch that verse 9? Then they will deliver you to tribulation. And will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Well, no, the church is going to be raptured right there. And then the Jews are going to be hated. Really? Are Jews, non-believing Jews, hated because of Jesus' name by unbelievers? No, you guys, no, a thousand times. It's referring to Christians. At that time, many will what? Verse 10. At that time, many will what? Fall away. I think I, when I was saying 8 and 9, I got the verses right, but, it's, uh, but the text in verses 8 and 9, between those two verses where Tim LaHaye puts the rapture, and many pre-tribbers. And the rapture is not going to be happening. Believers are going to be delivered to be killed. And at that time, many will what? Many will fall away, guys. Many will fall away. Do you know how much that breaks the Lord's heart? That many are going to fall away? Especially when Jesus says, I've given you these things in advance so you will not fall away, John chapter 16. Especially since Jesus says in verse 25, Behold, I have told you in advance there. But now the things he's warned them in advance are being told, No, they're not for you. Don't worry. Like Hananiah. You say, well, then aren't these guys doing the same thing Hananiah did? They're caught up in the same lie. But I don't assign to them the same heart. Because a lot of people inherit their theology. A lot of people become pre-trib. They just heard it. It's the only thing they've heard. A lot of people are in a lot of different places. And God continued to work with his people that were under delusion in the book of Jeremiah. Warning them to come back with great love. So I will preach to my pre-trib brethren, come back with as much love as God can give me in my heart. Please come back to the truth. At the same time, yeah, do I believe, but what, aren't there some of these guys who are false prophets doing it for with wrong motives? And so, yeah, absolutely. I'll let God sort that out. I'll just warn against their teaching. I'll let God sort out their hearts, though. You understand where I'm at? I don't want to judge people's hearts. I'll leave that before the Lord. I need to test fruit, though. The Bible says you know them by their fruit and what have you, and I need to look at teaching. And at that time, verse 10, many will fall away. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew, in, in Revelation 13, in chapter 14, when he talks about the rise of Antichrist and his persecution of the saints and warns not to take the mark of the beast, he says this calls for loyalty on the part of the saints. Those who keep their faith in Jesus and obey God's commandments. That's the end of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 13, around verse 10, 11 or so. Revelation chapter 14, I think verse 12. In those verses, you have variations of what I just stated, where he calls for loyalty on the part of the saints. And it's in the context in Revelation of going into captivity and being killed with the sword because of the Antichrist. It's in the context of not taking the mark in Revelation 14. In chapter 12, it's in the context of after the, he chases the woman, which is Israel, into the wilderness, then he goes after those who have the testimony of Jesus, which is the Christians. And they need to remain loyal to Jesus, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. So you have this idea taught throughout the Gospels of remaining loyal to Jesus, but many will fall away. And I've, I've given my, I gave a message one time, and I used in the debate, in the debate on section number seven, we dealt with the ramifications of believing something that's false. And when it was my turn, one of the things I mentioned was a lot of people are being set up to turn away from the Lord when the pre trib rapture doesn't happen. And my case in point, I used Tim LaHaye, who said, if the rapture isn't pre tribulation, you know, we don't get taken out of here before the tribulation. It's no longer the blessed hope, it's the blasted hope. We have no hope. That's going to discourage people. If you don't have any hope, what are you going to do? You can take the mark of the Antichrist, that's what you're going to do. But Jesus says, when you see these things begin to come to pass, he talked about hope. Lift up your eyes for your redemption draws near, amen? And when these things have all come to pass, he says, you know that I'm right at the door. He, engender, he encourages hope based on going through the tribulation because these are the signs that point out that he's coming. And guess what? When you're going through trials, you want him to come even more, amen? So our hope will get even greater because tribulation works character and good character works hope. Romans chapter five. Now, at that time, verse 10, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Be a big deception. That's the beginning of the tribulation with many false prophets. 
Because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will what? Grow cold. Revelation, Jesus tells the church at Ephesus to come back to their first love. They left their first love. You can leave your first love. It's real. Genuine believers can leave their first love and they need to come back. He says, repent, do the things you did first. You know, remember for whence thou art fallen, Revelation 2, 5, repent and do the things you did at first. Verse 13, but the one who what? The one who endures to the what? To the, to the preacher of rapture? Is that what it says? No. The one that endures to the end. He will be saved. Amen? And by the way, he's talking about not being physically preserved. He's talking about not falling away. Not letting your heart grow cold. Not letting lawlessness increase in your own heart. And not falling away because of the persecution. That's the context here. He that endures the end will be saved. And we know the context is a spiritual context. Because in Matthew chapter 10, he's not even talking about the tribulation period. He's just talking to his apostles about going out witnessing. Witnessing, he tells them not to fear man. He could destroy their body. But to fear God, he destroy body and soul in hell. Amen? And he says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before God and his angels. And then he says, also, he that endures the end will be saved. He's talking about persevering in your faith. Amen? And then he tells them what? In verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom, this gospel, the one that he gave his apostles, uh, shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then what? Then the end will come. Verse, 14, verse 15, therefore... Does it say, since you will be raptured, you will not see the abomination of desolation? Is that what it says in the next verse? What does he tell them when he says you, Peter, James, John, Andrew, the leaders of the early church who were supposed to teach everything he taught them to the church, which is what they did. And that's why the church was post-trib for the first few centuries. Therefore, when you see uh, the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through the Dan Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. So if you're in Judea at that time, because they're going to be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. If you're in Judea at that time, flee to the mountains. Why? Because he's going to set up his worship center in the temple in Judea. And that's where the per per persecution is first going to break out. Whoever is on the housetop must uh, not go down to get the things out that are in the house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. Because in the winter, it'd be pretty, pretty gnarly. If it happened on the Sabbath, uh, if you travel, how many have been to Israel? You know, if you travel through an Orthodox neighborhood on the Sabbath, it's dangerous. You could still get stoned to death. No kidding. You drive through there, you can get stoned to death. Okay? Uh, uh, and by the way, in those days, because Jesus told them no one knows the day and the hour, right? Uh, in those days, they shut the city gates So if you, on the Sabbath. So you couldn't leave. So if it happened on the Sabbath, you were doomed. So it's having them ready for all situations. Physically, you're doomed. You're right with Jesus. You're fine. Verse 21. For then there will be what? Great tribulation. Remember he just said in verse 9, they'll deliver you to tribulation. Now he's recapitulating. It takes place when the Antichrist is revealed in the temple. The abomination of desolation. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. For the preterists who say that this has already come to pass in 70 AD, absolutely ridiculous, okay? 70 AD went through some hard times, but nothing like it's going to be during the, and it was not the worst persecution that ever took place or worst destruction. The Holocaust dwarfed what happened in 70 AD by many, many thousands of times. Okay, Jesus is talking about something worse than the Holocaust here too. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. In other words, if Jesus continued to allow those days to, to march on and doesn't return when he returned, everybody would be destroyed on planet Earth. You know, it was impossible to kill everybody on planet Earth with their wars back in those days. But today, they, a lot of people believe they can destroy the world several times over with the nuclear weaponry they have and so forth. Verse 22, unless those days, we read that. Uh, by the way, unless those days had been cut short, uh, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Who are the elect? Paul talks about Colossians being the elect are made up of Jews and Gentiles who make up the church. In Matthew chapter 22, just a couple chapters before this, Jesus talked about going to the highways and byways and bringing as many as you could beyond the Jews who'd rejected him in that parable of the, of the, of the wedding feast. Remember, the Jews didn't, and he says he's going to burn that city, the king, meaning Israel was going to be, Jerusalem was going to be burned. Then he talks about in, in that same uh, 
parable, he talks about how, you know, people come to the wedding feast, but one guy's not wearing wedding clothes, amen? He's there in his own righteousness, on his own terms. He didn't repent. He's thrown out, amen? Remember, he's thrown out. And Jesus says, many are called, but few are what? Few are elect, few are chosen. Who are the chosen? Those who came from the highways and byways from around the world to the wedding feast. So even before chapter 24, just a little bit before that, he defines the elect as being believers in the gospel. That's us, okay? That's the context in the last couple chapters of how he's used the term elect. And he's speaking to his apostles, amen? Speaking to Peter, James, John, and Andrew, amen? And they're, the, they're elect apostles, part of the church. Now, uh, if you, we continue to go on, and by the way, Jesus already has the church in view, even before this. Do you know why? In Matthew chapter 16, 18, several chapters before this, he says, my, my, uh, I will build my church. I will build my what? My church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In Matthew 18, a couple chapters after that, around verses 15 through 18, he talks about if a brother is in sin, you know, go to him, right? So you can win your brother. If he doesn't repent, go bring one or two more. If he doesn't repent, bring it before the church. Prophetically, they understand he's talking about the church in view here, and they're part of the church. And if you believe the day of Pentecost or before that or round about that, it doesn't matter. You know why? Because the church is already in view here. The Peter, James, and John, and Andrew are the ones who are being addressed, and they know that they're going to be the leaders of the early church. Amen? And they're called in, in chapter 28. Let's go there real quick. Chapter 28. We'll go back to Matthew 24 in a second. Matthew 28. I already read this verses to you where he says to go and therefore, verse 19, make disciples of all nations. That's a great commission, right? Look at verse 20 teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the what? End of the age. So he keeps telling them, back to Matthew 24, the end is not yet, as he's taking them. The gospel of the kingdom we preach in all the world, amen, gives them the great commission to go to the end of the age, not seven years before the end of the age. It's so clear. If people want truth, there it is, spelled out. He's with us to the end of the age. The end is not yet, he says in Matthew 24. We already read that. The gospel came to preach as a witness to all the nations. Then the end will come. And he's with us all the way to the end of the age. And the end is after the Antichrist. He's making it very clear here. I'm sorry, I get excited, man. Because I know what's going to happen. And it's going to be so ugly when it happens. It breaks my heart when I think about it. If you say, why does Joe get so fired up on that issue? You should be fired up on this issue. You should care about what's going to happen. Many of your brothers and sisters are going to fall away, okay? Many are going to perish forever. Many professing believers are just, and it should break our hearts. And it should be an important issue to us if we care. If one part of the body hurts, the rest of the body should hurt, amen? And I see this coming prophetically, and it should matter to all of us. And if you're being talking to someone who's caught up in this delusion that, oh, Jesus doesn't want me to go through hard trials like that, you know? He would never allow that. I was told that, you know, I mean, I, I'm not kidding. I saw one guy at Jan Markell Prophecy Conference take a picture of Farrah Fawcett or picture of Farrah Fawcett up there in the movie that she played as a, when she was a model actress and she's all bludgeoned. She said, would Jesus do that to his bride? No, absolutely not. But guess what's happened to his bride, not at the hands of Jesus, but at the hands of Antichrist through the last centuries, at the hands of Stalin, at the hands of Lenin, at the hands of Hitler, at the hands of Marx, because of his, his ideologies and what have you, and at the hands of Nero, severing Paul's head from his body, and Domitian, and we could go on and on. There's been persecution for 2,000 years. Amen? God, so he twists it to, as though we're teaching that God's going to bludgeon his bride. No, God isn't bludgeon his bride. But guess what? His, his bride has been bludgeoned a lot through the centuries. But his, his bride recognizes that God doesn't allow us to go through anything more than we can handle, amen? Always give us a way of escape that we can endure our trials, amen? And he's always with us. In the spirit of grace, it says in 1 Peter, rest upon those who are persecuted. He gives us strength to endure, amen? And he's with us, amen? And I'd rather be with Jesus during time of persecution, standing for my faith, shining the light of Jesus because of my love for him and my love for what he's done for me, then say, oh, I want out of here, man. Let everybody just, you know, suffer without hearing the gospel and me being a light. Let your light so shine among men, amen, Jesus says, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And it's gonna be darkest during the tribulation period. And that's when the light is needed the most. He says, you don't shine a light, you don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel. No, pre-trib, you know, you just take it to heaven so nobody can see it. Wrong. That's when God's gonna let it shine. It's gonna shine like never before, by the way, in, in, during the tribulation period. Now, 
You know, I'm on literally on the first page of my message. I have not even looked at the notes yet. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Maybe I don't preach it. We'll see. I'll get, I'll get into some of it. Are you still being edified? Challenged, built up, encouraged. I thought, you know what? Before I got in, I go, I'm going to be getting a lot of Jesus' words. But I thought, man, I'm just going to start off with just uh, right when I got up here. I'm just going to go through Matthew 24 a little bit. But it's interesting. Verse 23. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, deceive, bamboozle, delude, if possible, even the elect. Now, that's why Jesus has told them over and over again, see to it that no one misleads you. Okay? See if that no one misleads you because they're going to do false signs and wonders. There's, there's going to be miracles. You're going to say, it's got to be God. People are going to say, no, wrong. It says in Revelation chapter 13 that the false prophet will bring down fire from heaven in the view of humanity to get them, to deceive them, to get them to worship the beast. So there's gonna be a lot of really strange, miraculous phenomena going on to where this false prophet, by the way, the false prophet looks like what? He looks like, anybody remember? He's, he looks like a what? He looks like a lamb, that's right. Who's the lamb a picture of typically in the, book, the Bible? Especially Revelation, Jesus. It's used of Jesus more than ever. But the, the false prophet looks like a lamb. But he speaks like a dragon. But he claims to represent Jesus. He brings fire down from heaven. The Antichrist is sitting in the temple of God, claiming to be God. And guess what? The world is following after them. And guess what? That happens before Jesus comes back. And pre-tribbers are being taught that Jesus comes back before Jesus really comes back. That's scary. No, no, don't take that. That's the mark of the beast. Did you hear that angel in the mid-heavens? Don't take that. That's the mark of the beast. No, this can't be the mark of the beast, Joe, because I haven't been raptured yet. And the rapture happens before the beast comes. Do you see where this is going? There's a lot of heartbreaking scenarios, you guys. And I just want to weep right now. I'm trying not to. Because we don't see how serious it is. But when we see brothers and sisters betraying each other during the tribulation period and had each over, and saying, this isn't the tribulation period. Mom or son, I'm sorry, you're, you're off your rocker. You know, this is the tribulation period. We'd be raptured first. It's a recipe for apostasy. When Hananiah, when Hananiah was saying that Jeremiah was wrong and we're not going to go through that time, he was preaching a lie, the Lord says, and it causes people to rebel. That's a picture of the, not Nebuchadnezzar as a picture of the Antichrist, but the ultimate Antichrist. When it will happen in mass, and there'll be all kinds of people that are rebellion to God because they're under delusion. I mean, how can you have so many scriptures which just blatantly says concerning Christ's coming and are being gathered together to him, not to be deceived by word or letter or spirit, or like a demon, to think that that day will happen before the fall away in the Antichrist. It spells it out. It's not going to happen. Don't be deceived to think it's going to happen before that. And then the church goes out and teaches this happened in these last days last couple centuries oh don't worry it's going to happen before that and we just throw all church history out we throw the clearest teachings of Jesus out here in Matthew 24 Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and many other places and it just sounds so good people gravitate toward it and how could there be such a big delusion because Paul said just like in Jeremiah's day in Ezekiel's day in Isaiah's day where the people said speak us to us smooth things pleasant words. And God says, my people believe a lie, and they love to have it so. Because in the last days, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, Paul says to Timothy, preach the word, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering doctrine. For the time will come when they will not heed sound doctrine. But after their own desires, they'll heap themselves teachers who will tickle their ears, many teachers, it says, and tell them what they want to hear. That's because we're in that time. People want a theology on their terms. Don't do that. If you're listening right now by live stream and you hold to a preacher of rapture, you need to look at the scriptures and say, what do the scriptures clearly teach? Because you're not going to read the scripture and come to a preacher view unless you've heard it from somebody first. The guy that I debated even, Dr. Stoffer, I heard him say in a message because I listened to some of his stuff before I debated him. I want to know where he was coming from. And he said, well, I had a lot of different views and I'm so happy I went to Bible school and I got straightened out. Ha, 
That's what happens. People read the scripture and then they all of a sudden go somewhere and, oh yeah, I misunderstood these things. Wow. Let's just believe what God's word says, amen? Amen. Jesus says in verse 25, behold, I have told you in advance. I'm warning you ahead of time. Verse 26, so if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go, or behold, he is in the inner rooms. King James has secret chambers. Do not believe them, because it's not going to be an inner room secret coming. Pre-trib preaches a secret coming before the real coming. They got two things off, two colossal things off. Jesus says it's visible. They say it's secret. I quote many of them in my video, Left Behind Let Astray, saying it's secret. They say, Jesus says it's after the tribulation. They say it's before. They got the cart before the horse. For Jesus, before he comes, you're going to have the wrong Jesus, guys. Verse 27. Tell me if Jesus isn't saying it's obvious here. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, it's not going to be what? It's going to be what? Obvious. Amen? Verse 28. Wherever the corpse is, there will the vulture, there the vultures will gather. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. What's his point? What's the point he just made about lightning shining from east to the west? It's not going to be secret. It's, going to be, it's not going to be an inner room. It's not going to be secret chambers. It's going to be obvious when he comes. Not a pre-trib secret rapture. We're going through this, and it's going to be obvious, like lightning shining from the east to west, like when you see vultures circling over a, car, cor, a corpse, right? A carcass of decaying flesh. You see a big griffin vulture, seven-foot wingspan, you know? And you see a bunch of them. What do you know is down the ground? A corpse. Well, guess what? When Jesus comes back, it's going to be like lightning shining from east to west. It's be like birds circling. It's going to be obvious in the sky. You don't have to wonder if he has come back or not. And you really don't have to wonder because Paul says that we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. Amen? So if you're not caught up meeting Jesus and you're talking to him on earth, hey, Jesus, how's it going? I heard you're Jesus. You're deceived. Okay? <sighs> In fact, this is interesting with regard to the vultures. Go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Somebody might have said, I thought he said we were going to be in Revelation a little bit. Here we are. Verse 11, and I saw heaven open, and behold, the white horse, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. By the way, from chapter 6 to 18, you have the tribulation period. Through chapter 6, throughout all of chapter 18, you have the tribulation period. And now it's coming to a close at the beginning of chapter 19. And God's, God's people have been calling out for God's wrath to come upon the wicked. Many, people will be, many believers will be in heaven because they will have died for the last 2,000 years and during the tribulation period, amen? But there's still those saints on earth who have been getting ready and serving Jesus. And guess what they're called? Look back up before his coming in verse 7, we read this. Let us rejoice and, be, and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his what? His bride has made herself ready. His what? His bride has made herself ready. Somebody commented in our video debate. They said, hey, in the King James, it says his wife has made herself ready. Well, if you're getting ready for a wedding, you're called bride or wife in the first century. Guess what? Guess what a bride was called in the first century before she was married, when she was engaged? A wife. She was fully bet- when she was fully betrothed before her wedding day, she was called a wife already. In fact, you remember when Joseph was going to put away Mary, his wife, it says she, it says her, it says actually says her husband, Joseph. This is before they're married. He's already called her husband. Was going to divorce her because if you were engaged before your marriage in the first century, if you found infidelity in the other partner, and obviously Mary hadn't committed infidelity. She had fulfilled the prophecy of a virgin will be found with child. You, could, you, could, you would divorce them, typically. Oh, and you know what? If one of you died during your engagement, guess what the other one was called? A widow or widower. Because you were considered husband and wife at the point of engagement, but not officially in the sense of uh, there was like a trial period, and then your marriage would come. So guess what? We are the bride of the Lord, but we're already his wife. And apostasy is related to the word for divorce, too, by the way. It's kind of interesting. So his bride is made ready. Look at verse uh, 7. Let's rejoice and be glad. Give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Did she make herself ready on earth for seven years? I mean, in heaven for seven years after rapture? No. 
the wedding and the wedding supper hasn't taken place yet. She's getting ready. And she's rewarded, as you're going to see, for her good works. What good works? The works that she's done. She's been enduring tribulation, shining for Jesus. And then in verse 11, he comes back. In verse 11, when he comes, 11 through 16, as king of kings and lord of lords, he comes as a bridegroom to his bride, but as a war hero to the wicked, to destroy the wicked. Same coming. His bride. If somebody tells you, well, the church is never mentioned in the book of Revelation, you know, when the tribulation starts. Well, you know what? It's mentioned over and over again. You see the saints over and over and over again. And it says that when this bride is blessed, look at verse uh, 8. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The bride is the saints. So when you read Revelation chapter 13, 5, and it says the beast overcomes the saints, it's talking about the bride. Do you understand that? So the bride is here all the way to the end of the tribulation. Jesus comes back in verse 11. In verse 12, and his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him, which no man knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, are following with him, following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. Amen. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, come, assemble for the great supper of God. Now the bride is preparing for the wedding supper of the Lamb. Amen. She's preparing for her wedding. And it's not like she got, you know, caught up and was raptured and prepared in heaven for seven years before her supper. That's a long time to wait, you know. She's preparing. But guess what? Guess who eats first? The birds eat first. Come, come assemble yourself, it says, to the great supper of God. Verse 18, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of men, both free men and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which the, he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. Verse 21. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. When Jesus says, it'll be like lightning shining from the east to the west, right? And he says, it'll be like the vultures over the corpse, right? He's referring to it being a visible second coming and also it not only being a blessing to the believer in Matthew 24 he goes on to say the tribes of the earth will mourn and some of you we've talked about this before uh, through the years but it's interesting that in Israel during the diaspora when Israel ceased to be a nation they rejected Jesus he said every stone of the temple be thrown down and that they'd be led away in all the different nations which happened after Jesus was rejected and they'd be going through that period of time for a long time uh, one of the prophets indicates two th about 2,000 years, and then they'd be brought back, and that's exactly what happened. And, but when it was a desert, it was hard to find water and trees because it'd become a desert for almost 2,000 years. There were hardly any birds there. But it's interesting. There's going to be a bunch of vultures at the second coming of Christ. But I think it's very fascinating. Uh, you can read Ezekiel chapter 39, by the way, 17 through 20. You don't have to turn there. But Ezekiel 39, 17 through 20 talks about this as well. But you have the scriptures, or you have not only the scriptures, but you have history. It's interesting what's going on in Israel right now. Guess what? There's been a lot of news reports through the years that there's a resurgence of mass vultures by Megiddo and in those areas. Isn't that interesting? Okay. One report says Israeli scientists help vultures spread their wings. The Nature Reserve's authority... The Israeli Electric Company and the leading zoos in the country are working to return the vultures to Israel, from which they have almost disappeared. In the project, all the vultures have been marked and their mates have been identified. 
The article continues to state, Israel is not alone in the effort. Across Asia, bird conservation groups in cooperation with the government officials are racing to establish captive breeding facilities in a final bid to rescue the vultures from the brink of extinction by encouraging the birds to breed and raise young. Isn't that interesting? Finally, we read, the enclosure of the Jerusalem Biblical Zoo operates in close conjunction with the authorities throughout the country and the participating with Spreading Wings program to save the vultures. And then subsequent reports are that the vultures they're seeing more and more carrion birds all over the place. Well, guess what this is? It's all preparation, man. Everything's lining up, you know. We talk about things lining up. That's just an interesting thing to have lined up. Back to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 27, just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be Wherever the corpse is, there where vultures will gather. And guess what? It's not as though we're being gathered to a corpse, right? It's a picture, simply a picture of what Jesus Christ's second coming is going to be visible, right? But if you're the bride, you're going to go up to him, amen? And there'll be birds in the midheaven too. You'll be with Jesus and you'll be with the birds. And then the, vault, the corpse is going to be below for those who have been left behind. Amen? They're going to be wiped out and destroyed at his second coming as he comes not only for, as a bridegroom for his bride, but as a war general, the king of kings actually, lord of lords, to bring his mighty wrath upon the wicked. Now, we read verse 29. You should have this circled right now, at least for a few words. But immediately, does it say immediately before? Because right here it's going to talk about how the church is going to be raptured. Tim LaHaye even says this is the rapture, although he calls it the second phase of the rapture. He has no first phase anywhere in the Bible. He can't find it. Otherwise, he'd been $10,000 richer or somebody would have been. But he calls this the rapture, and he's right. There's a rapture here because it says the elect will be gathered in, chapter, in verse 21, but when does it happen? Then immediately, does it say before or after? After, guys. Circle that. Underline it. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with the, uh, of the sky with power and great glory. Verse 31, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. Remember Paul said that dead in Christ rise first, and then we who are alive will be caught in there, and he says the trumpet of the archangel, and what hap, hap, here it says, and Paul says that the last trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4 is the other verse I just referenced, uh, around verse 17, 18 or so. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. There it is. Happens after the tribulation then, though. Now learn a parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. So we are watching these things, man. They make your hope even greater because you're saying, wow, it's getting close, amen? For pre-tribs, there's no signs that lead up to the, to the pre-trib rapture. It can happen any second. But Jesus clearly gave us signs and if you're going somewhere that's important and somebody gives you signs to read on the way, you better read them, amen? Or you'll get deceived and go off the wrong path, amen? So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Verse 34, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. The generation that begins, that sees these things take place will not pass away. It all happened within a generation. And a wicked and adulterous generation that's characterized by uh, those folks then will be way beyond with lawlessness increasing and everything beyond where it was in, that, in those days. Verse 34, truly I say to you this, or I'm sorry, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. You can always bank 100% on Jesus' words. Verse 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. And with Kirk Cameron, even though he'd become post-trib, he said somebody tried to trip him up with this verse. Uh, uh, Brother Austin, last night, he says, hey, what do you do with this verse? Look carefully now. Look carefully now. But of that day, is this said in the vacuum? Is this verse said in isolation of the other verses? No. But of that day, what day is he talking about? The day of his return, which happens immediately when? After the tribulation. You get it? Understand? 
That day is reference to his coming after the tribulation. In other words, what he says, but at that day, no one knows the day and the hour. He's not just saying it could be any day and hour. He's talking about his return after the tribulation. Amen? If I say after New Year's Day, 2019, sometime after that, some day and hour after that, no one knows this is going to happen. That means it's not going to happen before what? 2019. Amen? When Jesus says of that day, referring to his coming after the tribulation, he can't be referring to something before the tribulation or at the beginning of the tribulation. Amen? It's just that clear. It's the context. Context, context, context. A text used out of context is always a pretext, okay, to push an agenda or a false view. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the uh, flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away took them all away there is better translated like the ESV and several other translations swept them away the flood just swept them away so will it be at the coming of the son of man then there will be two men in the field one will be taken because remember he's going to come and gather us up amen one will be taken and the other will be left two women will be grinding at the mill one will be taken and one will be left so there will be those who are left behind at his coming after the tribulation though the days of Noah, no one's day, the hour, thief in the night. Well, look at verse 42. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. That's why you have to look at the signs that lead up to his coming. Amen? That's how you stay on the alert. Doesn't mean you get up, quit your job, get in a house or on a big hill and say, I'm looking. That's not what he's talking about. He's about watching for the signs of the tribulation that lead up to his coming after the tribulation. Are you with me? Verse 20, 43, but be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would not have allowed, or he would have been on alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. There'll be a lot of people think, oh, it can happen here, it can happen there. No, you have to watch for the signs so you're not deceived by a false coming, Amen. Because he's, if the good man of the house was prepared, he wouldn't have allowed his house to be broken into. But he's coming like a thief. That means any moment. No. He's talking about his coming after the tribulation. Context, context, context. By the way, Jesus didn't say he's coming like a thief to us believers. He's talking about if you're ready, it's not going to happen. Your, your house won't be destroyed. In fact, Paul makes it very clear. He makes it clear he's not coming to a, a, as a thief to the believer whose eyes are open. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he talks about how we caught up to meet him in the air. And he says, uh, concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for the day of the Lord so comes like a thief in the night while they are saying peace and safety. Sudden destruction will come upon them. That's not a rapture, is it? That's a second coming. Sudden destruction will come upon them as travail upon a woman, a child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness on that day as though that day should come upon you like a thief. Catch that? You, brother, not in darkness that day, as though that day should come upon you like a thief. Not come on us like a thief. Because you are children of light, children of the day. Those who get drunk do it at night and so forth. It talks about the children of the night. Amen? We're children of light. We're children of the day. Amen? We're expecting Jesus to come back and our eyes are to be opened and we're not carousing and drunkenness and partying and beating the maid slaves. And Jesus says that we cut in pieces. He says, my Lord delays his coming and beats the maid slaves and gets drunk with the drunkards and won't be ready. We're being ready. Our hearts should be in love with Jesus, expecting his return. Amen? So all this is, is vitally important uh, that we understand this, you know. And uh, he goes on to talk about that faithful servant. Uh, verse uh, 45. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave who his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? And I want to be one of those, don't you, who gives out his meat, the word of truth in proper time. Blessed is that servant or slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. So, it doesn't mean watching like you're looking up in the sky, waiting. It means you're living a moral life. You're living for Jesus. Your lifestyle reflects your faith. It's evidence. We're not saved by our works, but it's evidence of our faith. Amen? And he's found doing his master's will when he comes. Verse 47, Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that slave will come at a time when he does not expect. When he does not expect him at an hour which he does not know. 
and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's guys. And eventually the lake of fire. And that's horrible. That's why you want to make sure that you do not believe that you don't, that you, you don't follow an illusion that you're not going through trials and that tribulation happens in your lifetime that you wouldn't go through it or that you, want to, or you don't want to believe also that, hey, once you're saved, you can go beat the maidservants, get drunk and, and so forth. No, you're going to be cut in pieces, man, and thrown where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. These are lies that the body of Christ is deceived by. And you know, there's all of chapter 25, which we're not going to read. I want to encourage you to read that. The, the, ten, the, the ten virgins, they, they all had oil and they all had light, lamps lit at first. And then guess what? Well, they all had oil and they fell asleep, man. They dozed. And what's the lamp? What's the oil? Oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. They all had the Holy Spirit. They all had lamps. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light in my path. The Holy Spirit gives us light through his, God's word. Amen. But five of them, man, they ran out of oil and the door was shut. Then he talks about the peril of talent. He talks about the sheep and the goats. He talks about all these things. And I've studied some of these things recently, so I'm not going to get into them. But the last passage I want to take you to is Luke. Go to Luke chapter 17, then we'll be done. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus warns them. And uh, verse 26, he says, And just as it happened in the days of who? Noah. You know, in Noah, there was a, po- a pop- it said people began to s- multiply on the earth. There was a population explosion. There was a po- population explosion in the last hundred plus years that's just massive. And then wickedness began to spread in Noah's life, right? In, or, or I should say in, in his world, violence and evil thoughts continually. That's happening today. So it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They will be eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. Verse 29, But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, one, I'm sorry, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down and take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Don't become fixated on the things of this world. The things of this world are going to disappear. Amen? Moth corrupts, thieves break through his steel, but not in heaven. And Lot's wife was so focused on this world, she lost her excitement for what the Lord was doing and delivering her. She turned around and God destroyed her. Verse 33, whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. Now, I, one lady had a, 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 a dream, she said, about the rapture, and everybody's being caught up, all the believers, and she was caught up, and all of a sudden she got just to the roof and stopped. She's like, we couldn't go any further because there was a rope tied to her ankle, which was t- t- tied to a very important piece of furniture to her. And she said, God was showing me that I was in love with the material things of this world more than him, you know? I don't know if I got that story right. I don't know if her dream was even true, but... It's a good illustration. Verse uh, 34, I tell you on that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field and one will be taken and one will be left. Whoa, man. What's he talking about? Guess what? Lot and his family were taken out of Sodom and those who left behind were what? Destroyed. Noah and his family were taken away from the uh, destruction the flood came, and they were put in the ark, which is a picture of Jesus, one way in, one way to Jesus. He's the only way. Uh, and verse 37, And answering, they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said, they're like, Where? What, 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 where's this going to happen? And he said to them, Where the body is, there also what? The vultures will be gathered. Again, what's he talking about? You're asking where? I'm letting you know it's going to be very visible. It's going to be very obvious. Again, he's emphasizing that when Jesus comes back, it's going to be very obvious because right before this, he, he upbraids some of the religious leaders and saying that when he comes back, it'll be like lightning shining from the east to the west to be backed up. I don't have time to do that. He's talking about being invisible coming again. And by the way, we're with Jesus and the vultures, amen? They're going to eat first. The carcasses are those who left behind, like, lots, like, like those wicked in Sodom that he rained fire upon, like those who perish in the ancient deluge, the flood. Are you right with Jesus? If 
you were to die today, would you be taken into heaven or left behind and put in Hades? If Jesus comes in our lifetime, are you going to keep your eyes open and watch for the signs? Or are you going to be deluded into thinking, no, he can come any moment. I'm not going to go through those times. And if that happened, it, it wouldn't be the Antichrist. I could take the mark because Jesus is going to come first. Or you might be saying, hey, John has brought up free trib and what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to start searching the scriptures more. And if somebody comes and wants to put a mark on my right hand or, to buy or sell, then I'll, I'll turn. I say turn to the scriptures right now. But at least take it as a wake-up call to be prepared for what's going to happen in the future. Amen. I love you guys. It's a great assembly of brothers and sisters here. I look all over. A lot of people that just love Jesus. But maybe you don't know Jesus yet. Maybe you're not saved. Guess what? You need to make sure you're right with God because Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What does that mean? He says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he said, because people were talking about people that were crushed by a tower and killed and, 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 and so forth. And he says, do you think that, you know, he basically was saying, don't think you're more righteous than they were. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In other words, we look at other people and we forget that we need to make sure we're right with God. Amen? In the book of Revelation, chapter 9, after all these trumpets, horrifying things happen to the wicked. God's wrath is poured out during the tribulation period. Not on the believer. Believers are spared from his wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. Amen. Revelation 16, his wrath is poured out of the wicked. You know what happens again? Both times it says, and they didn't repent. So a lot of people will be under a strong delusion. It'll be too late to repent later because they'll be so deceived and so hardened in their anger, they won't repent. Today is a day of salvation. Oh, there will be some, I believe, Revelation 11, there'll be some that says, give glory to God. But they're far and few in between. And the longer you wait, and the more you harden your heart and stiffen your neck, the less likely you are to turn to Jesus later. Get saved right now while you're hearing the word, while you have the opportunity. The Bible says today is the day. Now is the acceptable time, amen? Jesus Christ died for you. He died a horrible death. He paid for your sins on the cross. He was beaten. He was, God's wrath fell upon him on the cross so he could die in your place so you don't have to accept, you don't have to have God's wrath so you could pass from death to life. He took, accepted God's wrath so you could pass from death to life and have his life, amen, and have eternal life. The Bible says, if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved, amen. I encourage you right now, embrace Jesus right now with repentant faith. Put your trust in Jesus and what he's done on the cross and dying for your sins, buried and rising again and conquering the grave and accept him and his life and you'll have eternal life, amen? Do it right now. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord and let's cry out to God. Father God, we love you. For anybody here who is turning to Jesus, we pray that you give them strength that they would confess him as their Lord right now. This would be the day that they made him Lord of their lives. Confess him as your Lord and Savior. And Father, for those who already love Jesus, Father, we pray that we would love the lost and be witnesses and spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. That we would love those that are in the church, including those who are deluded and not become disgusted, not become just in shock that they don't believe what your word clearly says. But we pray, Father, that you would be loving lights to them, lovingly reaching out, helping them to understand so they're prepared to face the time that's coming. In Jesus' name, prepare us all, Father, for whatever days lie ahead. For even before the great tribulation, your son said, in the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Give us grace through all the tribulations that we face. In Jesus' name, amen.